And I thought you were going to do a documentary about me, a working mother trying to balance career and home. Face it, Mom, no one's interested in that. So you passed up something worthwhile like that to do girls in bathing suits? <laughs> Jason, can you believe this? Your mother's got a point, Ben. There's nothing wrong with doing a boring movie. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know about my study group. Oh, don't be a funny daddy. I'll be your study buddy. I'm about to embark on one of the great challenges of my scientific career. This work right here is going to change history. I think this is going to be our greatest mission. I don't have time to study. I'll never get into Stanford. I got big plans for you tonight. I got maps. I got charts. I'm going to see you through this because my credibility is on the line. It's at this point that you'll want to start taking notes. Welcome to the Sitcom Study, the podcast where we contemplate the TV shows we grew up with and search for the truth and wisdom within the tropes and cliches. And Amy, what, may I ask, are we discussing today? Time to get out your old movie camera, Jay, because we're making some movies. Yep. And if you doubt for a second that I have an old movie camera, I have many. This <laughs> Including is... one you just recently bought so we could look at old footage from old movies. Yes, we are talking about sitcom episodes in which the characters make their own movies. This is a big one for me, but I'm going to ask you first. Do you have any experience? Did you try to make movies or did you have friends that would rope you into being in their movies when you were younger or anything I, like that? There was definitely a kid in our neighborhood that did this but we were not like great friends we got, were better friends like later on so no I never got roped into the making of the movies but every time you tell stories about how like for every high school class project you would make a movie with your friends yeah. this guy did the same thing Yes, I was very much obsessed with all sorts of creative stuff as a kid. Uh, I didn't I didn't get a video camera of my own until I was like 14 or 15. So prior to that, I wrote novels, you know, as, as you did, <laughs> as you, do. Uh, you know, novels, comic, comic books, books etc. Yes, I was just always little skits and plays, just anything. I always, you know, anything to do with sports or socializing, count me out, anything to do with some sort of performance performance or coming up with a story or something that was where I lived and so yeah as of about halfway through high school when my grandpa got me a video camera a little Sony camcorder that that was my thing I was very much Vinny Del Pino you know drafting my friends into being in my little movies anytime we could get away with doing something like that for school I would do that and and yes I very much considered myself a, a filmmaker and and to this day have, you know, to modest success have, you know, <laughs> continued to uh, pursue that. And so, yeah, you know, we talked about this a little bit with the comics episode and we talked about Bob, the sitcom about the comic book artist. Anytime there was a movie or a TV show or anything that dealt with the creative process, that dealt with people making a movie or filming a TV show or anything like that, you know, that dumbass Jackie Thomas show with Tom Arnold, I was all in for that because it took place it was like on a the behind set. the scenes look. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, all of these things, this this Doogie Hauser episode, when we get to that, this was a big thing for me, you know, even understanding at the time, you know, even something like Muppet Babies, like understanding they were kind of kidifying it and this wasn't exactly what it was really like. I still really took these things as a template for, oh, cool, I could be like that. Yeah. I could have my friends be in a monster movie or something that I made. And so, uh, yeah, this this was huge for me and I definitely I've just been looking forward to, to getting into this. Yeah, we have a great lineup. So we are watching Growing Pains, Season 5, Episode 25 Ben's Movie Doogie Hauser, Season 2 Episode 8, Revenge of the Teenage Dead, Community Season 1, Episode 3 Introduction to Film and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Season 5, Episode 11, Mac and Charlie Right a movie. Yeah, so starting with Growing Pains, we've talked about Growing Pains a couple times now. I'm going to say in general, it doesn't hold up that well for me. And the reason I'm going to say is 
I think the parents are really good. I think yeah. I really like Alan Thicke and the mom. They've got, you know, at the beginning of this one, we're going to get some of their frisky energy and yes. you know, all the stuff that I'm sure I thought was either boring or repugnant when I was a kid. <laughs> when you were a kid. Right. Now these middle-aged people being a little saucy with each other, I like them. What I think overall is these three kids... <laughs> They're duds. Like yeah. the the you know, I complained about Kirk Cameron last time, and I'll I'll paint Jeremy Miller, the younger brother, with this brush too. They've got this eye all over the place. Hey, Dad, I didn't mean to cause all this trouble, but I did it. Like that <laughs> annoying, like man child talking with your voice way up there. Like there was just something about that in the 80s that we seem to or find appealing. Or he grew up like watching Kurt Cameron yeah. and basically was like, okay, now I'm the teenager in the family and that's how I'm going to act. Yeah. And now that we're into the 90s, you're getting, I talk about this all the time, the ubiquitous influence of Jim Carrey and that general style of acting. Yeah. And so, yeah, I find Mike and Ben, the two boys, just kind of annoying. Right. Uh, we're going to get in this episode a sort of Peter Sellers-esque, uh, you know, Kirk Cameron playing three or four different characters throughout yes. the thing. Yes. And then Tracy Gold, the sister, she's she's okay like she doesn't bother me well but... i thought she was really funny in this because so like the only real carol we get you know in this episode is her playing her mom in the movie yes and it was really funny because she was doing like a bad acting thing yeah but also kind of was like her mom like uh -huh. at the same tone and so I thought it was really interesting like you have to be pretty good to know how to be bad at being your mom and so yeah. I thought I was oh, enjoying the, that a yes, little bit the many layers right. and yes this and is... same with I mean not the same with Kirk Cameron playing his dad playing Alan Thicke right or playing uh -huh. you know the dad in that but I thought I thought Tracy Gold had the the tone of the mom's voice kind of just right and the cadence yeah, she had she's, uh, sure I just think in general she's a little bit neither here nor there for me I'm sure yeah. I made the same observation last time the names in this it cracks me up how the name generations are reversed like right. to me jason and maggie are, are like young our generation names, names. Yeah. yeah whereas carol like carol. there's not been somebody younger than carol 50 and mike. named carol <laughs> well, ever. carol and mike are the parents in the brady bunch there, there you go right yeah, and so every time they talk about carol i do the same thing i'm like oh are they talking about the mom no that's the yes. daughter to name the daughter carol Carol is such a bizarre Maybe she was named after choice. her grandmother. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, that that's my general sort of take on this show, is it doesn't hold up that well because I don't think the teenage kids are that fun. Right. Um, well, and we've got, this is what, season five, and we have yeah. a little baby right. who is going to do the magic aging thing yeah. at the we're end in of this between, season. We're in the uncanny valley in between when this baby is going to age up to later be played by Ashley Johnson as right. like a four or five year old kid. For now, she's just a baby. I don't know where Leo is in this. He either that's came later. and went or no, no, he later. hasn't been here yeah, yet. Yeah. So yeah, so the the kids are going to get good. I feel like Leo has some talent and Ashley Johnson, like they're <laughs> good. But yeah, this current set, not so much. Not so much. Well, and we kind of, we were talking about this. We sort of have done ourselves a disservice in terms of rewatching parts of Growing Pains, because I think it would be one that you and I would probably revisit as just like, oh, let's watch it through and let's just enjoy it. It has that kind of like, you know, origin story 90s sort of feel of the kind of what it, what was it like to be a family sitcom in the 90s? That was yeah. like the first. I mean, yes, it started obviously in the mid 80s, but it was the kind of prototype that pushed into Family Matters and um Full House and that kind yeah. of stuff. It felt it has a similar feel, even though it's not a Miller Boyette, right? Yes, that's what I would have said before the podcast. And now I, I I guess that's still true. But now it just feels like a wannabe family ties without the charisma, without the hook. Of of the political having, yeah, which you said that. before, like without having the like Michael J. Fox yeah. that makes this it is the one that the more, more than any other show for better or worse. There is no gimmick whatsoever. Well, this the is, gimmick is that she's gone back to work, which they say over and over as right. like a joke which in, in this a episode. modern world in which women have jobs. That is not 
not a gimmick. <laughs> right, but it was a gimmick in 87 yes, or Mom, whatever, 86 when show. it started. Yeah. So anyway, so they are, uh, what I was saying is that we've done ourselves a little bit of a disservice because we've only watched one kind of earlier episode yes, of that was this. much better. And that was better. And it focused on the parents, right? Yeah. That was the uh, tempted by a sexy co-worker. Yep. And Maggie went back to work and she had this not very sexy co-worker wow. that... Um, uh, <laughs> that's, that's all a matter of opinion. That Dr. Jason Seaver was jealous of. But so... But the other two episodes we've watched, this one and the tonsils, like we had your tonsils out episode. Yeah, that was the dream were, episode. Yeah, dream. That and they were both over. centering around Ben. Once when he was really little, and now he's a little bit older. And I think that's the issue. Like, I wonder if we have a Carol-centered episode, if it would be better. Or yeah, if we had maybe. a Mike-centered episode, maybe the whole well, voice see, thing that's... Would, would be more, have a place. That's a big know? maybe. I, <laughs> I feel like uh, I, I feel like most of them, you know, or, or at least a fair amount of them are given over to Mike, as I recall. That's just, you know, this yeah. is the 80s, early 90s. We wanted to see the teenagers. Sure. Um, They're just getting older now. Yeah. But this is very much a Ben centered episode. And what a little punk this guy <laughs> is. Right. He's going to have to ultimately be lectured by his parents about respecting women. Right. He just has this sort of like, again, this, you know, we keep saying it, it's the 80s, right? It's it's the, the mid to late 80s. So say, at this it's point, 1990. Right. right? So yes. you're sort of Ferris Bueller, Zach Morris, sort of like lovable slacker character is in the air. And he's I feel like he's trying to be that he's trying to be like, oh, I'm kind of horny and I'm kind of trying to get away with everything. Thing right, and just he, be that kind that's of a vibe. What his brother has been all along. Yeah, but he sucks at it. Like he's just <laughs> he has none of the appeal he's of a Mark Paul Gosler. His little smirks and everything. I just you know uh, to paraphrase Colin Jost, one of the most punchable faces I've ever seen. But wait a minute, though, is it just because you don't? Like, you didn't like him in that time. Like, wh if you had the same nostalgia for Ben that you have for Zach Morris, uh, would you would no. you still feel that because way? Because I don't... I watched Growing Pains here and there. I watched it just as much as I watched Family Ties. And when I watch Family Ties, I don't go like, oh, that bigoted Republican, how dare he? You know, we talk all the time about how Michael J. Fox wins you over he does. despite of what he's saying. Yeah, with with this funny. Ben Seaver character... He's adding more odiousness onto what he's saying <laughs> no, with his true. lack of charisma. That's that's very true. And the okay, so the whole point of this is that Ben is making a movie for his English English class project, yeah, just like I did, just like you did. And the parents are of two minds. So they hear him and his girlfriend, Ben and his girlfriend, get into an argument in the driveway and they go out to see what's going on. And Ben has covered the driveway in sand and he's doing like a beach scene yeah. in his movie. And all of his girlfriend and all of her friends are in their little bathing suits and, you know, jumping around and screaming and stuff. And she's like, you only did this movie so you could grope me. And the parents are like, what? And Ben's like, that's not true. That's not true. That's not the only reason. And then yeah. the parents are like, all right, well, show us the footage. And he's like, but it's not cut together yet. It's just the raw footage. And and so I'm not done with the movie. So it's not you're not going to be able to tell. And the parents are like, we don't care if you say that you're not doing this because you want to grope your girlfriend, then right. let's see the dailies. let's see the let's see the footage. So then we go watch the footage. And as the footage is coming out, Maggie, the mom kind of gets this idea that Ben is telling the truth. And he's doing this movie because he's feeling ignored by his parents because they have the new baby and whatever. And then Dr. Jason Seaver is not having any of it. He is he's like, nope. That like this movie is a hundred percent so he could see his girlfriend in a bathing suit. Yeah. So let's just flag a few things here because this is going to overlap with community a little bit in the sense of a parent sitting down to watch the uh, watch the masterpiece and right. say, oh, this says something about our relationship. Yeah. But also uh, more to the point up front here, Ben is the freaking Harvey Weinstein of uh, the ABC family sitcoms, right? Well, this is about, like casting couch bullshit. He's 
he's not raping multiple women no, in order this... to allow them to be in movies. So let's slow the little like use of Harvey Weinstein there because that's a horrible person. But this kid, he definitely is like, uh, I would love to be able to smooch my girlfriend on camera. So I'm going to write a kiss yeah. into the movie. This, uh, yeah. I I tried to, as we went through these episodes, I tried to come up with a real life filmmaker to sort of match with each one of our, our and characters. And you're going with here. Harvey Weinstein? No, not Harvey Weinstein. Whoa. No, th- this, is, this is a little more down to earth. Okay. All uh, right. For Ben, my comparisons are Russ Meyer, right? Russ Meyer's an older guy from the 60s and 70s. He was like a, one of the original sexploitation uh, directors. So he made Faster Pussy. <laughs> Cat Kill Kill okay. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Uh, you're you're like softcore movies. Your Bikini Babe movies of the late '60s. Or if you want to be more modern, Michael Bay. You know his movie is going to have a crazy. It's going to be about an alligator that you know terrorizes the town or whatever. So fantastical movie with lots of babes running around. Not the Michael. There is not a Michael Bay movie about an alligator terrorizing the town. You're not saying that, no, right? No, but just okay. that it's fantastical <laughs> yes, nonsense. Yes. So Ben's over movie the top stuff. is about. Yeah. Um, Families who took their kids on like alligator safaris down in Florida when they were younger and got at little baby alligators. They brought them home, but then they got too big, so they flushed them down the toilet. And so now all those sewer alligators are coming back up out of the toilets and attacking people. And it's this great shot of all, like he uses it over and over again, all these little wind up. Yeah, that was um, good. Uh, alligator toys, you know, going like, nying, 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 yeah. you know, looking like hungry, hungry hippos, just like, and he's got them kind of spread all over a sidewalk. And he takes a really close up shot of these like 50 toys, just and then he has the Jaws music playing over it, like they're coming for the kids on the beach. It is so funny. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of musical plagiarism here. At first, uh, they're using a generic version of the Danny Elfman Batman score. Oh, I know this nice. for whatever his like whatever the first scene is and then yeah they do the jaws thing i do love it whenever ben does any of these little makeshift special effects you know and it's supposed to be obviously that they're dumb you know uh well then he's just trying to do it as best he can like your stuff like your movies that is the thing that's why i I do stuff like this all the time in my animations where i'll approximate goofy you know macgyver type special effects like this you know like later on when he'll have the president be a little puppet on a popsicle yes yeah yeah all that stuff and he's got somebody doing like a barbara bush impression and a and a george bush george H.W. Bush impression, yeah. But uh, but yeah, like we said, Mike Seaver, his brother, Kirk Cameron, is going to be doing a sort of Peter Sellers or a Eddie Murphy in the clumps, if you will. He's right. going to be playing like three or four different characters. Yes, he plays the dad, like he plays Jason Seaver at one point, and then he plays... The guy who's like a, what, a reporter or the guy who's like figured out that the that the sewer alligators are coming back out of the toilets or something. Yeah, he's like, yeah, whatever scientist or something that they go to That's to right. explain yes. it. Yes, he was uh, a scientist. Yeah, like you said, this sort of, you know, once Ben kind of gets called in from filming his Beach Bunnies scene and the parents reprimand him and it's sort of established that the whole family is going to sit around and watch his movie, that sort of becomes comes like the framing device essentially right. for the movie itself being the sort of centerpiece of the episode and what we get you mentioned how he says well it's not edited yet so i guess what we're meant to understand because what we see is mostly edited right. we sort of get the impression that ben basically filmed his movie in order yes and then would occasionally make a mistake and have to back up a little bit and right. film again and then he's planning on editing it together which was something in general in these days you know this was long before we had the nonlinear editing stuff yeah. on the computers. And so this is something that they would always gloss over in these movies and TV shows about people making movies, you know, is, is how did they do that? Yeah, how did you they can't edit it splice together? VCR tape. So yes. he was he even said to his friend Stinky at one point, he was like, I have to rewind the tape now and get rid of that. And so he would. He was like editing while shooting. Yes. In camera editing exactly. is what we call that. 
And then, and so then he would like, if something went wrong, he would just rewind and record the scene over it the way he wanted it, rather than the way they do in real movies, which is do 50 takes and then... gather footage. (laughs) Exactly. But yes, as he says, he's still planning on one final edit, I guess, where he cleans everything up. Because there's parts where, like, you know, you see him take the camera down and it's like filming the floor or it's like, you know, there's little pieces, there's jump cuts and things where he's rewound over something but has he hasn't cleaned it up yet yeah exactly but so they all sit down to watch it and the main part of it at least for the beginning is his his siblings carol and mike playing parents right and, and the confusing. baby the new baby is playing is, is him, their child no right. not or ben not him, yeah Ma- they're, well they're, they're they call him tim right in the movie it's child, like tim jim. or jim yeah yeah but so is this meant to be a period piece because mike's outfit yes he puts on like they're saying 1979 okay, or so, like he was born in 1976 or whatever so this is like 1978 okay, so this is even though he has a different name this is supposed to be like the birth of mike this right. is supposed to be the early days right. of the Seaver family and yeah so mike has these fake uh sideburn mutton chop things and a silly mustache and just like looks like a 70s guy right. and he's you know they're calling him jason and carol they're calling maggie and so it's supposed to be like yeah they're the parents circa 1970 whatever yeah and so yeah there's elements of what we're gonna get later with abed there's elements of like i'm gonna make a movie about not myself per se but my family and my parents and all that but then that sort of just becomes like the backdrop for the alligator thing. Yes. And the well, it's a horror movie, right? So yes. he the thing that is established right at the very beginning is that this guy, Jim Johnson, whatever his name is, nobody ever remembers who he is. And it's been that way since he was born. They forget him at the alligator farm. They go back and get him. He is followed by an alligator. They flush the alligator down the toilet every single time. So Ben, then we fast forward in time and Ben is playing like the grown up main character, yeah. Jim, whatever. And every single teacher he encounters is like, who are you again? Every sing- his his girlfriend, who are you again? So like the, the shtick of that is nobody ever remembers who he is. He's entirely forgettable. And this is where Maggie, the mom watching it, is like, oh, he's this is a cry for help. He's not, you know, we're not paying enough attention to him. And so she calls Jason into the kitchen and is like, we, you know, pause the movie. Jason, we need to go to the bathroom. And Jason's like, I don't need to go to the bathroom. She's like, yes, you do. So they go off in the other room and they have this whole conversation where she tells the dad like what she thinks is going on with this movie. And he's the psychologist, right? So and he's just like, nope, he's a 14 year old boy. There's a lot of yeah, there might be some elements in that that might have but no, this is this is a 100% so that he can make out with his girlfriend. This is he wants her in a bathing suit and he wants to make out with her. And that's why he's doing the movie. And the mom is just like, No, that's not true. And so they don't bet, but they basically bet. And they're like, we're going to watch to the end and then we'll see. Yeah. And so they go back in to watch the other half of the movie. The phrase sick puppy was like (laughs) a big sort of like that had a moment (laughs) in the 90s. They say it at least twice in this episode. Carol says to Ben, you're a real sick puppy. And then they sort of reprise it when the parents are talking amongst themselves or rather to Ben It's like a young pervert. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But I just remember that being a thing that people would say in the 90s. Ah, he's a sick puppy you know it just (laughs) took me back but yeah we have um debate about is it a cry for help or is he just a perv the line that he keeps saying i guess within the within the film that he says to his girlfriend he says i'm jimmy johnson i've been going to school with you since before you had breasts yes like what a weird and bad thing to say like just like what a bad thing to write into the movie because he wanted to say breasts and he wanted to talk about her breasts i'm sure you have plenty of questionable things in your high school movies (laughs) oh absolutely that goes without saying and obviously at the end of the day him being kind of a sick puppy and it also being a cry for help because he's doesn't get enough attention are not mutually exclusive they it can be right it can be both but every single time he gets called on it and 
and starts to get away with it, he has this smirk and a wink that he does. So we know as the audience that like all the women in his life, his mother and his girlfriend who eventually forgives him and is like, I saw that this was just a really lovely movie and it wasn't about trying to kiss me. Like, they're all wrong. Yeah. 100% wrong. He was so doing it so that he could grope his girlfriend. Yeah. And those smirks and winks to the camera are what make him a Zach Morris without the charisma. Like, it's just like, no, this this does not work. Like, those things don't necessarily hold up to modern society either. (laughs) You know, but at least Ferris and Zach, like, they're charming us as they're doing it. Not just, like, turning us (laughs) off more by having to look at their faces. (laughs) But uh, yeah, Mike also plays the alligator when the the full grown alligator shows up. Yes, it's Mike that's right. In, in the alligator suit again. Yeah, we get more of the wind up alligators. We get the forced kiss at the end. He just like grabs her and like dips her and kisses her okay. like you would at the end of a movie or whatever. But she, that's when she realizes and smacks him. Like okay. that's the end. Of, she's so, like, wait a minute. I see why you're doing this because she realized the writing's bad. This is, you know, apropos of nothing. Why are you just grabbing me and kissing me? And she's like, you just wanted, you know, us to be in our bikinis and you only are doing this to to grope me. And so she smacks him and then the parents come out and then that's yeah, the end of also- the movie that we see. I, it doesn't make sense to me why he would want to pull this scheme in the first place. Like, if he was some nerdy guy who she wouldn't give the time of day to... Well, no, I think like, it's I just that they movie. aren't, like, going around making out all the time because they're super young. They're, like, freshmen. Yeah. So I think it's just, like, he's trying to contrive a reason that he can kiss her a bunch. Yeah, I guess. I just... That plan... I don't relate to that plan, to the idea Did you of, never like, try to contrive a reason to kiss a girl? I think... I think I might have, but it would not have been something like this. It would not have been, let's do it with other people around. Let's record it on video. Let's show it to my parents. Well, like, no, all of I that think stuff. it's more, I mean, I don't think he expected all of the, that part, you know, but I think it was more just like, I mean, I definitely did this. Like, oh, yeah, um, will you run lines with me, guy that I like, even though you're not playing this sure. part, so we can, like, have this moment together? A hundred percent. Yeah, I guess, but the, I don't know. It just, to me, the, the benefit of like well we'll have to kiss as part of the thing like it it didn't seem like it would get him that much further than he would just get in real life with a little bit of patience. You're taking way yeah. too... Okay, first of all, with a little bit of patience, how'd that work out for you in high school? <laughs> Second of all, I think you're taking it way too seriously. It's just, like he 100% was just trying to have a moment where he could make out with his girlfriend. By the way, he didn't tell her he was going to like grab her and kiss her and dip her and yeah. everything. And maybe that is like farther than she had been comfortable with no, up until that point. I mean, point. apparently so. And so, yeah, that's kind of, you know, he he gets the sort of talking to by his parents, right? But I feel like nothing... Well, so they they basically come to the end of the movie and um, Alan Thicke's character, he turns it off and he's like, well, I think we're all caught up. So you're going to need to settle a debate for us, son, because your mother thinks this and I think this. And he's like... Mm, and just kind of, you know, looks like the the cat who ate the canary kind of face. And he's like, yeah, well. And Carol, uh, uh, Maggie is just like, oh, I can't believe I was wrong. And Ben, and I can't believe that you would choose to do that. And and any girl. And so this is this is now the end, right? Like the last little bit, they're all kind of proud of his girlfriend for figuring it out and alerting them all to it. And and they were all sort of piling on Ben, like, and any girl that would, you know, not figure that out is just an idiot. Da, 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 ding dong. Now the girlfriend arrives and she's like, Ben, I was so wrong for thinking that you did that just to get close to me. Obviously, you're an artist and you're trying to tell a story and the movie is going to be so great and I support you. And then he gets to kiss her and then he like smirks again yeah and then it ends like it began with the parents mike or uh jason and maggie getting frisky and skunky the neighbor kid. i think he's skunky i think his name's skunky i'm looking at it 
I think <laughs> I say skunky. The kid's I name is skunky. Stinky, and um, uh, Mike's friend was named Boner. Okay. So this he's, is the way of it with the friends. He's looking at them. He's watching them through the window. Like, that's his movie, is yes. watching the parents make out through the window, and that's the final. So thing. all the kids are creepers is yeah. basically what's going on. Yeah, so in terms of tracking the trope, I mean, we get some fun stuff with, you know, again, how the parents read stuff into the in meaning the movie, of the movie yeah. and everything. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely a bummer in the sense that what we're really getting, and unfortunately this is true to real life, is sometimes filmmaking is just exploitation and trying to get people to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Or just put yourself in proximity yes. with attractive women, yes, which exactly. I think is more true more often than not. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Doogie Hauser. Season 2, Episode 8, Revenge of the Teenage Dead. Yeah, I don't think we've talked about Doogie Howser since way back in like our third or fourth episode when yeah. we talked about Vinny uh, delivering the baby. In an elevator, this that's is, right. This is going to be another Vinny-centric episode. Well, sort of. I mean, he's yeah. in and out. This isn't as Vinny-centric well, as it's the other true. one. Screen time-wise, it's not as dependent on him, but he's definitely going to be a big focus here. And this is the one that, like I said, I, I remember vividly watching this when it came out. I was a big doogie head back in the day. I had lots of the weird shirts, just like Vinnie Del Pino used to wear. <laughs> but yeah, the idea, you know, this is early 90s. Uh, the idea of this kid being a movie buff, you know, this is before Tarantino and the myth of, you know, you could go from working in a video store to being a filmmaker. So this was still like a relatively new concept, you right. know, that this is a sort of like an archetype, you know, you have some pe some kids are a jock and some kids are a, you know, a, a burnout or whatever. And this kid is like a, a young filmmaker type yeah. kid. And uh, this whole notion that he's going to be making this horror movie and he casts his friends and it's you know it's kind of like a night of the living dead type thing which is already this very sort of bare bones kind of grungy thing and it's going to be all the more sort of uh homemade you know like that all of that i just really ate this up as a kid of like oh cool like i i like the idea of this you know well and i think it's interesting that both of the movies that we get now so far are horror movies yeah because well, that's... it's like okay to be low budget it's Definitely. okay to be sort of schlocky. You and know, that if you're is absolutely movie. true to life. For the most part, all of the sort of major independent movie successes, these movies that sort of famously like multiplied their budget by an exponent of 200 or something yeah. tend to be horror movies. You had Halloween in 1978. You had the Blair Witch Project in 1999, Paranormal Activity in the 2000s, these movies that are made for next to nothing and really use their uh, their lack of resources as an asset. Their marketing um, tool, yeah. yeah. And then it's also something where on the other side of it, the audience for it is, for better or worse, is considered forgiving and right. undemanding and they want certain things they want you know they want violence and gore they want nudity and sex you know it doesn't have to be very long it doesn't have to have good acting you know all that stuff so yeah it, there's this sort of grand tradition of like even if you do end up being a prestigious filmmaker someday you start out making a horror movie I feel like Vinny Del Pino even though he name checks Scorsese and even Fellini I think the filmmaker that he reminds me most of is George Romero, you know, and which is pretty... What, uh, what do we know him from? Well, Night of the Living Dead. Okay. So it's not that much of a stretch <laughs> when the title of the episode is Revenge of the Teenage Dead. But we see uh, at the beginning of this, the cold open is going to be another sort of mini trope of this thing. The camera point of view, right? The yeah. thing where we're seeing what the camera sees. We see yes. the blinking light, the REC. And in this case, it's black and white, which I feel like is a little sort of anachronistic. I think if you were filming with a video camera in the 90s, it probably wouldn't 
I don't know. Maybe the viewfinder would I be in black say, and I white. I was I thought the viewfinder was black yeah. and white. I thought that's why we were yeah, seeing it that way. Yeah, at least on some of them. Because, it, like, at, when they cut, you know, at the end of that sequence, when they cut, they show, you know, now they have the regular cameras, like the Doogie Howser cameras that right. we're seeing through. And they show that he has the mask, the, like, um, J- is, like yeah, Jason, Jason mask, like the hockey mask, on the front of the camera lens so that you're, like, seeing through the eyes yes. of this mask. Which which is, like, I guess that would be a clever thing to do to, to get that effect. But, like, obviously, you you know, if you if you wanted to make a shot look like it was through the views of the killer, you would put something around the edges so that right. it would frame it just so. You wouldn't use the actual hockey <laughs> mask on the camera. No. But I think the fact that they're showing it in black and white and that it's a zombie movie makes you immediately think of Night of the Night Living, of Living Dead. Dead yeah. uh, the, the George Romero movie. And yeah, we get, you know, a few minutes of this. We get Doogie running around screaming or whatever. And then you get the old cut and it's, you know, we sort of reveal what's going on. They're filming a horror movie in Doogie's kitchen. Yes. Right. They're interrupted by the mom. Like kind of all home. around the house, but yeah. like it ends in the kitchen and Doogie's about to get slashed. His arms are about to get slashed off. Yeah. Um, his girlfriend Wanda. has already been like killed somewhere else. She's yeah. like a zombie or laying dead somewhere. And then midway through the scene, as the parents have come in and started taking the like fake body parts out of the fridge so yeah. that they can make dinner, then Vinny's girlfriend comes in from outside in full costume with the chainsaw and is like, uh, are you just going to leave me out there? Like, what the hell is going on? And this sets up the whole movie, because, or the, the whole rest of the episode, because she quits as the killer. She's yeah. like, this sucks. You've had me hiding, hiding in a bush for an hour and a half. Like, I'm not... I'm not hiding in a bush anymore. And he's like, but you're the star. And she's like, no, I want to die like everybody else. Yeah. This is another thing that strains credulity a little bit in terms of the way that they portray shooting a movie or TV show in movies and TV shows. Right. Most of the time, I mean, this isn't always true, but most of the time you would be filming little shots you know little quick snippets yes you wouldn't say like oh hey go wait out in the bushes no for he's the next- doing the like the full-on it's not stopping yeah, all no. the way through this multiple scenes a one well, yeah, yes, right? <laughs> he's doing the whole scene as one take which granted started out as a thing that orson wells did in touch of evil and was like this rare cinematic feat and has now become a cliche that every netflix series does at the beginning <laughs> of their first episode so yeah maybe Vinny is doing a oneer and it's supposed to be that the whole sequence happens in one take and that's part of his vision but for the most part it comes across as kind of silly that yeah everything would need to all sort of unfold over the course of this five minute period right. or something and Janine's been hiding in the bushes this whole time but yeah that sort of sets up this story that Vinny is shooting his movie he's got to figure out what to do about the fact that Janine his star has quit on him and then we go to the the you know Doogie Howser credit sequence and sort of switch gears. Right you now know? we're gonna go. At, you know Doogie. It like the show is starting. We're going. The next scene is in like a boardroom in the yes. hospital, and um, there's another kid prodigy. Mm-hmm interviewing for a job I thought but it turns out he's not interviewing for a job he's trying to get into medical school at the like that's a research hospital yes. so he's trying to get in he's interviewing to like be the next child prodigy at this med school that yeah. is there even Doogie Hauser has some sense of realism in terms of how young you have to right. be because <laughs> he this kid is 13 he yeah. is he's very recognizable I thought he was a young Casper Van Dien but he's not it's this kid actor named Christopher Pettit, 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 Pettit something yeah. like that. He's another one of these tragic stories, though. He dies before he's 24. Oh. Yeah, like right before he's 24 of a drug overdose. But so, yeah, if you see him and you're like of our age bracket, you'll absolutely know who this kid is. Yeah. And then he I was like, oh, he's got to still be doing stuff now because he's got this gorgeous face. Like he's got these eyes that'll melt you. And then, no, of course not. Yeah. He's another no, tragic he's story. He's definitely, yeah, he's a little pretty boy, but they have him dressed in a way 
And they even have Doogie dressed, I think, more than usual in a way to really emphasize right. their differences. The that- kid is wearing a full on suit. It is oversized. It's too big for him. Like yeah. they didn't have they couldn't tailor it in. They, you know, it's also the 90s. So we wore things big. But he it's like the long line suit that you buy at JC Penney. Yeah, like he absolutely the- was I mean, wearing a full on suit, not a three piece suit, like, right. but a suit you would wear to work suit and tie. And then Doogie is wearing his like untucked shirt. Exactly. Goofy his normal, tie. Mm-hmm. Or I feel no like tie. They have to remind us sartorially because the dynamic most of the time is Vinny or various other characters are the screwballs. Right. Doogie is the one that needs to learn to loosen up. Exactly. This one is going to flip the script. So I feel like, you know, not that he doesn't dress kind of like this in general, but I feel like they really emphasize, like, look at Doogie with his silly tie and his sneakers and he doesn't button up his shirt. Like, and the fact that he has a life outside yes, medicine. he's the happy medium. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, the way this is going to go is this, this you know, younger prodigy kid, his name's Gregory. He yep. insists on being called Gregory, Don't not call Greg. me Greg. He won't call Doogie Doogie. He has to call him Dr. Hauser, which does beg the question, like, again, talking about ways to sort of emphasize, like, we need to make sure everybody remembers that he's a teenager, like, Doogie, like, why, whoever <laughs> chose to be called Doogie. Well, is like, this, that's the I kind bet of thing, it's something that Vinny came up with. I guess. To I'm me, gonna, that's something that I'm you're like, vi- Mom, if you call me Doogie one time in front of my friends, <laughs> I'm moving out. No, I like, bet it was the other way around. I bet his name is like Douglas. His name is Douglas. Right? Everyone knows and that. And so, and see, I, I don't know. I'm guessing. Um, but yeah, I bet his people, name is Douglas. The proper, and then his friend, Crazy Vinny, who, you know, we find his dad at the end gives us like that little heartwarming, you know, touch about like yes. so glad you I have feel a like little this Vinny episode in your was life. Written and produced by Max Casella <laughs> with how like lionized <laughs> Vinny is. But yeah, it is a thing. All of the serious adults in his life call him Douglas. Right. But he he or likes Doog. to be called Doogie. Yeah. Uh, and it just as he was insisting that this Gregory character call him Doogie, I just started getting hung up on that. Like what a bizarre nickname. Call me Doogie. And just how funny it is that again for the title of this show show they were like it's not going to be enough to just call it dougie hauser or something mikey or whatever you know like we need to make sure he has the most infantile (laughs) nickname possible (laughs) so that you understand it's about a teenage doctor but anyway doogie is going to have to take gregory under his wing it's going to be doogie's job to make a recommendation to the board as to whether or not this kid is ready for for medical school he's going to be like their youngest student ever you know, right. Doogie was probably the youngest until now, or maybe he went somewhere else. But so the idea is like, all right, we're going to have, you know, this is like the premise for a movie in the yeah. 80s or 90s. You uptight prep school genius has to hang out with a slightly older, slightly more laid back genius <laughs> who just happens to be filming a monster movie with his friend. Right. So Doogie's kind of immediate impression of this Gregory kid is that he is too uptight and that there's no way he's going to be able to make it through med school if he doesn't have a way to blow off steam. And this kid, like, he calls his dad Stuart. Um, you know, he is like, oh, Stuart wouldn't like that. You know, if I yes. if I were to have if I were Very to broad take strokes. off if I were to take off my suit, Stuart wouldn't like yes. that. Oh, if and I were we ultimately to meet do the it. dad, and right. it is true. He yeah. is a crazy again, right out of the eighties, nineties playbook. The uptight parent yeah. that is the taskmaster and won't let you sing in the choir with right. sister mary stevens or whatever. <laughs> you, you can't you can't be in the show you can't play puck you have to kill yourself dead yeah. poet society which we're going to get later on uh-huh. right so um the the little the like the little guy gregory the younger one is like wants to hang out with doogie wants to get to know him but on this like professional level just for networking purposes really is not getting it and and doogie's trying to be like yeah you have got to have a balance in your life and he's trying all these different ways and it's not happening it's not working and then Vinny comes in and he's like i got a great idea and so he's like that's gonna be my monster in the monster movie and this will be the way that we're gonna force him 
to get out of his suit. We're going to force him to have a little bit of fun, yeah, like they relax. They reschedule their afternoon appendectomy. Or That's whatever. right. They were going to go watch an appendectomy. And instead, he's like, no. And then his dad calls. So the dad, Stuart, calls as the movie is like wrapping. Um, and they like through the filming, he the kids being very annoying. Like, he well, keeps- yes, yeah. he's cast as Dr. Hyde. We have to say, first of all, Vinny's movie is like a pastiche of every horror, horror movie, movie ever, <laughs> right? We've got the Jason mask from before, which is a little on the nose. Like, I feel like even the most unoriginal of the glut of knockoff horror movies in the 80s didn't actually have a hockey mask on their killer. <laughs> they came up with something else. But we've got the Jason hockey mask. We've got zombies all over the place. Right. And uh, body parts in the fridge, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. And I guess now there's Dr. Hyde. Yes. So we get well, the that was the Hyde way thing. they had to convince him that he was not just playing any like monster in the monster movie. You're playing Dr. Hyde. And right. he was like, OK, I but Dr. Do. Hyde wears a, uh, a hockey mask yes. and he's like a sort of hunchback. Thing. He's got these huge football shoulder, shoulder pads, pads that yeah. he wears underneath this like big kind of cloak thing yeah so he looks really wide and yeah. like broad shouldered even though he's like the tiniest kid there and so he comes in and he does the big scene and then he keeps stopping and being like well why would my character do this and this and this yeah he's and, pointing out the logical fallacies of the scenes right and Vinny is like gonna kill him and and doogie's like no just come which on. i will like, say give him a chance just as somebody with this experience quote-unquote filmmaker casting my friend Friends and fellow students and stuff. This is definitely a thing. And you have to ride that line <laughs> as a director of like, you know, sometimes people have a point and you want to be collaborative and sort of be receptive to like, oh, gee, I hadn't thought about it. That kind of doesn't make sense. And if they're noticing it, maybe someone watching the movie would. And then sometimes you have to just be like, like the people that deal with D later and it's always sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> We're on a schedule, you know? We're losing daylight here we can't stop to rethink things every time you're you a body a... lay down <laughs> yeah. yeah and so i feel like that's the mode that Vinny is in when this kid is pointing out like well why would i do that that's not ergonomic or whatever right and he's like just do it and that's basically you know doogie pulls him aside and says like look i'm gonna make this real simple for you i'm the one who decides whether you get into this medical school so i'm basically ordering you to just do whatever the fun. fuck just have Vinny fun. tells you to. Yeah, yeah, he says that, but he also says, like, specifically, submit yourself to Vinny's direction. Yeah, Don't that's think true. about it. Do whatever he tells you to do and just, just relax and go with it. Yeah, stop overthinking. Right. Yeah, and that's what he does. And so, which is this sort of parallel, and this is a one of these like recurring tropes that we're going to get throughout the these episodes, right? Is that the parallel here is that that's what Doogie does in his life, right? So in the earlier one, we have this kind of parallel of the movie is a cry for help, but also a reason to kiss your girlfriend. And so there are some things there that the parents are, you know, especially the mom is like, oh, oh, well, maybe we pay a little bit more attention to Ben. In this one, we see Doogie realizing that, like, not only is it good to have this balance in your life, but it's Vinny that is the one that you, that can, like, just give it over to Vinny and follow what he does. Even though he seems crazy, he's going to lead you down a fun path and it's going to be okay. It's essentially, like, like we were talking about from the end, he's sort of retroactively appreciating right. what Vinny has done for him. Meanwhile, little Gregory, you know, they get the call from his dad saying, I'll, you know, what, what how, are you how doing? How did the appendectomy go? Yeah. And, and they were like, oh, we had to reschedule it yeah. for an uh, amputation. <laughs> well, what I put, uh, what I put was that he has a Cameron from Ferris Bueller arc. You know, yeah. he has that sort of like, you know, he's he's got to learn to stand up to his dad. You know, it's not just that he has to loosen up and then when the dad shows up like i said before like 
arch villain just right out of that 80s sitcom playbook of you know just uh just you know i won't stay this is highly irregular well right? so but this is later on because they yeah. he he ends up staying a little bit longer and hanging out with the kids and like drinking soda even yeah. though he's not supposed to drink but soda he tells the dad because he has the line about like doogie's taught me all kinds of things like how to kiss girls with tongue oh, yeah he does say that that was weird so anyway but the when we see the dad isn't in that scene. It's like the next day after. Well, I thought it was when he come he comes to pick him up. No, this is later. They're in the boardroom again, okay. and it's the closed board meeting where they are deciding whether or not this kid can get in. And Doogie has given a glowing recommendation yeah. because the kid let go and was able to like find balance and learn how to have fun once he was like out away from the influence of his father. And so Doogie's given this glowing recommendation to the board the board is about to approve him and the dad bursts into the closed meeting and is like that kid right there pointing at doogie is trying to upend my son's whole career he got him to drop out of medical school he's talked to him about all these things and it's just he's just jealous he doesn't want him here and the dad's like going off and uh the board and doogie are like uh we were about to approve your son. Yeah. We didn't realize he wanted to drop out of medical school. And then the kid comes in and is like, dad, do we didn't do anything like I, he just made me realize that I want to slow down and be a kid. Yeah. And the dad's like, you know, you don't understand. This is the rest of your life. And is like yelling at the kid. And this is all your fault, Doogie. And, or, you know, Dr. Hauser. And so that's that's when that happens. It's not at Doogie's okay. house when he's having fun. It's later. Yeah. And so then it ends with like the kid, like you were saying, having his Cameron moment and being like, dad, there's nothing wrong with slowing down. Like I'm allowed to be a kid. I want to go to parties and eat pizza and make movies with my friends and kiss girls. I want to do those things. Yeah. I'm 13. Yeah. And so then everyone kind of goes their separate ways and cools off a little bit and we get Vinny's movie premiere. Right. And this was the part that I just found so inspirational as a kid, you know, just this idea of like, oh, okay, yeah, he made his movie and now he's having everybody over to the house to watch it. Like, I could do that. Yeah. And things have settled down, right? Yes. Because the kid has stood up to his dad. This is some time right. later. And we're meant so, to understand he's decided not to go to medical school and go to regular school and have like a regular childhood for a few more years and so when he shows up again we see the sartorial sort of character indications you know and they're cheating it a little bit because it's like of course he would dress more informally to go to his house versus an interview but nonetheless i think it's very much supposed to sort of strike us when we see gregory now he's got this hot pink shirt oh, t-shirt yeah. on <laughs> he's not wearing glasses anymore his it's hair's like, um, a little different it looks like one of those um the, the shirts that you would breathe on hyper color oh. shirts do you remember those yeah i just thought it was just something that you would get he looks like he's on his way to the beach or something like i said no glasses anymore yeah. his vision's better so yeah just very much telling you like oh he's he's just different now he's he's got a whole different vibe and his dad just from the jump has a whole different vibe too he comes in he's he's even dressed now he's got a nice sweater yeah he's calmed down a little yeah, he's not <laughs> on his way from his job at the law office or whatever right and yeah he basically just apologizes and it's like sorry never mind i guess you're not so bad yeah um, and this you know this has really been a great turn for my son so. yeah and so we get Vinny's movie. This is also the sort of his reaction, or I guess like his reaction to the reaction is a lot like... Oh, right. It's like Tommy Wiseau in The Room. Yeah. Uh, if you remember that movie from like the early 2000s where it was like this guy made like famously the worst movie ever. You know, it was laughed at when he first premiered it. And then, you know, like over the course of the following months did the mental gymnastics to embrace that as to like embrace, that was all like part it was of his meant brand. to be funny in yes, the first place exactly right. and like oh no that's what the room is it's this crazy funny movie it right. was never meant to be a serious. You know, serious character drama which it absolutely was meant to be but so yeah Vinny premieres his movie in the living room it starts with Vinny himself he's he's sort of like halfway halfway between Alfred Hitchcock and the Crypt Keeper right the 
the way yes. he like introduces it. Yep. Uh-huh. He like in the movie, he pops up out of a coffin and is like, let me tell you my story. This I'm dead. movie. Yeah. And then they, you know, as they get into the movie, people are laughing at it because it's a goofy, low budget, right. shitty horror movie. And, and so, he's so upset. Yeah. So he goes into the kitchen and Doogie follows him. And I remember this scene. Like I remember Doogie's little speech where he says all week, you've been talking about being the next Fellini or the great Scorsese, but what you made in there, it wasn't like any of those. It was a Del Pino. You're the one true Del Pino. And what you made in there was a Del Pino. And that's enough to kind of turn Vinny around and make him feel good about himself. And yeah, you know, I just, I always... I, I always liked the idea of like, oh yeah, he did this crazy thing, you know, like he cast all of his friends and the story of the movie is really just like bitten off of all these other horror movies, but it's still just sort of like, it's kind of like what that movie Be Kind Rewind is about, you know, it's just like almost like the act of making it is more important than the finished product, you know? And so this crazy thing that he made, yeah, that's a Del Pino. And so, yeah, it just kind of ends with like, everybody gets a kick out of it. And then, you know, Vinny, uh, Doogie and his dad have that little talk, like you mentioned before, where the dad was like, Doogie, I used to not like that Vinny was your best friend, but somewhere along the line, I realized that kid is... The best damn thing that ever happened to this family. You know, like they really <laughs> like it everybody on needs a little Del Pino in their lives for the same reason. Like, you know, seeing that 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 he's the 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 youth and the joy and the kind of go with the flow fun person that brings that into Doogie's life like Doogie could have and his family could very easily have gone down the same pathway that Gregory and his father did yeah and they didn't because he always had a a little Vinny coming in through his window screaming about something crazy that was totally kid-like yeah and just to track the trope we do get briefly uh back at the beginning there's a little exchange where Vinny says to janine his girlfriend something like uh what if i let you uh sleep with the director huh what'll that get me and she's (laughs) you know she just plays it off but that's pretty much the only vestige of this idea of filmmaking to get the babes right? right that's not what it's about for Vinny. this one and this is a thing uh you know this is the episode where they choose to focus on it but unlike ben from growing pains Vinny being an aspiring filmmaker that's his that's a thing for his character all the time all the time yeah and not so, just for this one episode yeah and you would see that uh repeated in dawson and dawson's creek again oh, this, yeah, this started right. to become a thing in the 80s and 90s the idea of the kid that wanted to be a movie director yeah i mean it well it's spielberg's story right yeah i think him when he gives interviews he's always talking about like oh yeah i was that kid with the little movie camera and I was always making movies and then he went and made a movie about how he was that kid so (laughs) yeah and so you see again you know part of Vinny's real skill here and this I think holds true of the the real life people that we're talking about the Roger Corman's of the world and stuff that he he is has this P.T. Barnum thing of like he can gather people together and get everybody to do this crazy thing with him yeah you know just like a young Sam Raimi making the evil dead with no money and just you know with his brother and his friends out in the woods and so yeah this 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 is a good one is my boomstick yeah yeah. that's my one Raimi reference (laughs) all right no it's a good one okay let's move on to community season one episode three introduction to film yeah so this one what's kind of interesting here is the way this works out timing wise usually we try to sprinkle them throughout the decades and then once in a while we'll kind of have like a concentration where everything will be in the 90s or something in this case we've got the two that came out the same year, right? Doogie Hauser and Growing Pains were both like within a few months of each other in 1990. Yeah. Right? One was, I think, the end of 90 and one was like the beginning of 91. Yeah. And now these two that we're about to talk about, Community and It's Always Sunny, are both, what, 2009? Yeah, 2009. And Community is like October 2009. And the Always Sunny December 2009. This starts with 
the Dead Poet Society uh, right. spoof. We get John Michael Higgins yes. from the uh, from the Christopher Guest movie. And Pitch Perfect. He shows up. Yeah. This is community doing sort of what it does best, which is starting to go down a certain road. And you go, oh, oh I get it. They're doing a Dead Poet Society thing. Right. And then one of the characters goes, oh, what do you think this is? Dead Poet Society? Yes. And they kind of go like 10 steps beyond. They where... call out what it is that they're doing and they laugh at the thing that is a cultural yeah. touchstone that everyone would know about anyway. And they're like, oh, look, this is happening in real life. Yeah. And so this John Michael Higgins character is very much like Robin Williams from Dead Poet Society. He yes. wants everybody to carpe diem, to seize the day and to live life. The details are very funny. You know, this is, I think, maybe just the second time we've talked about community. So you get that great Dan Harmon writing, you know, all the, yes. the fun things. Take off your shoes, throw off your your shoes you know he's telling them as get you on your inspired. desks yeah he has them get on the desks and then one of the girls falls which is um, hilarious it and that's exactly like this is why i think dan Harmon and the russo brothers this this combination is just so funny the show is just so great it's like they're getting up on the desks and you're like rolling your eyes because you're like oh you know it's so dead poet society they've already called it out and it's you know it is what it is and so here he goes and then um surely or somebody is like why do the teachers always you know or why do you know teachers like this always try to make you stand on your desk that doesn't make any bam and the girl yeah. just falls and it's so great yeah his homework assignment is i want you to swim in a lake and tell 10 people you love them that's right, right? and so this whole story is going to be that jeff the main character ostensibly right. uh, joel McHale. the one thing that he can't do is be sincere yes and so He's he everything he does. This John Michael Higgins character, even though he's all sort of weird and flighty and touchy feely and like kind of dumb, sees he, right he, through. Yes, it. he does see that everything that Joel McHale does is is just a gesture and is calculated. Fake. Yes, yeah. he calls out his sprezzatura, as we like to say. <laughs> you know, he specifically calls out how Jeff's hair is like specially styled. Yeah, to how look long as does though, it take you to make it look like you just got? out of bed yeah exactly and so he's just not buying what he's selling right. you know and so that's going to be jeff's story this whole episode is just trying to sort of win over this uh john michael higgins character and we get another robin williams call out right because he wears the mork yes, rainbow the suspenders. suspenders um uh jeff does when he's trying to like put on a show to prove that he's seizing the day and living in the moment. He wears these like Mork suspenders and this light up Christmas tie and, you know, is doing it like flies a kite through the quad and is trying to like do all these things. So the professor sees him and the, that's when the professor's like, how much money did you spend to try to make all of this just happen? Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be his thing this whole time. But meanwhile, Abed, yeah, he wants to take, you know, intro to filmmaking or whatever. Uh, his his dad won't stand for it. There's a funny line where he says, uh, "9/11 was pretty much the 9/11 of the falafel business." Right. You know, because his dad's a falafel monger. Yeah, and, he uh, owns he owns a falafel restaurant or something, and so he wants Abed to come work there. Yes, again, and, straight out of the sitcom yes. playbook. Uh, don't follow your dream. Do, you know, do what your parents want Go into want the family business. That's what you have to do. And so, and Britta is like, you know, th this is early days. So we still have this kind of like, Jeff is only here so he can, you know, cheat his way through the community college so he can get his degree and get back to his life as a lawyer. Britta is this like, you know, female empowerment. She hasn't become a joke of herself yet. She still is this like female empowerment. Do whatever you want. Like, you know, I moved away from my parents and went to New York and I'm an anarchist and I'm a this like she's this activist in the later season. She becomes like a joke of herself, like it's revealed over time that all of her activism is sort of half assed and she is yeah. kind of a pain. Um, she Britta's everything up like it becomes yeah. it becomes her and Jeff, he doesn't verb. have to be as much of a cad as it goes on. Like they just get to be more like 
people right. and less gimmicky and archetypey yeah. uh, as the show goes yeah, on. Yeah, although she becomes more gimmicky later on because she becomes this like caricature of a okay. feminist. She becomes a joke instead of uh-huh. what she is at the beginning, which is a cool girl. Gotcha. Um, and so that's kind of like her story arc, which I always kind of found a little disappointing, but it's written so well that I also don't care. Like, it's very funny. So that's kind of like, mm, but also this is funny. <laughs> well, and it's better than the original dynamic, which was she's just the sort of like, she just has to be normal. And Jeff is going to be like macking on her and trying to like trick her and seduce her. Right. And, and she's you know, always going to see through it. Yeah. That's kind of like the early days of the show. So that's what we're in now. And they have, you know, they've sort of developed this kind of like, yeah, he's always going to hit on her, but she's going to always get the goods. Like, you know, she knows what's going on, but they have a friendship. And so when she decides to like butt in to Abed's family matter and give him the $70 so that he can take the film class. Jeff's like, you should probably stay out of that. And she's like, you can pay me thing out of that and like gives him shit. But then immediately the, you know, the dad comes in and yells at her and yells at the, at Abed and Abed's like, I know what my movie's going to be about. It's going to be about my parents. Um, will you, Jeff, Britta, will you guys be my parents? And they're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be your father, you know? And so he's like mining all of these interactions throughout the episode to tell this story of his parents, we find out of his parents' divorce and like the demise of their relationship yes. all because of Abed being a little weird. Right. So this is the comparison here is that Abed is Spielberg. I think he's obsessed with his, the relationship with his father. He's making his fablemans, right? right. The same way Spielberg decided to make his semi-autobiographical fablemans movie. Abed is making this. So do you think Spielberg got the idea from Community? <laughs> <laughs> no, just because Spielberg, you know, even without the fablemans, I would still pick Spielberg. Spielberg as the match for Abed because he's famously obsessed with the relationship with his dad, yeah. you know, going back to E.T. and any other. But uh, yeah, he's he's taking a class that assigns him to make a documentary and he or just assigns him to make a movie. Anyway. Well, movie. he's no, because he has a joke. He says, my first assignment is a documentary. A documentary is like a real movie, but with ugly people. Oh, God, but, I forgot that part. <laughs> right. But then he sort of fudges it by ultimately making, you know, making what I think is is kind of a popular thing these days, a piece that sort of blurs the line. Right. He makes more more of a fableman's ultimately, yeah. more of a fictionalized account. Right, his because his dad childhood. is like, you want to take care of him? Fine, you take care of him and pieces out. And so he now Britta is like fully funding everything you know she's giving him extra money for all of the camera equipment she's making sure he has spending money she's doing a whole budget to like put her son in quotes through college and you know she keeps seeking advice from jeff who's also seeking advice from her like they're kind of sharing in their woes of him not being able to fool this professor and she is worried about abed and then abed starts like buying pizza for everybody and buying lattes for everyone. And she's like, Abed, what are you doing? Yeah, That's not, not going what to the, the class. Yeah, not going to the class because he's too busy, quote, making the movie. Which I will say, this is also something I related to a lot. As we discussed in our going to college episode, I went to college for film studies, but hated my film classes. <laughs> and so much like Abed, in fact, like Abed is still doing this for a school project, at least ostensibly. Right. Most of the time, I wasn't. I really was like him, like just straight up skipping the classes and doing badly in them and working on my own weird project. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, all the while, Abed is sort of like furtively filming them, you yeah. know, and this is another sort of keystone of filmmaking this idea of like you don't need to understand it like you don't need to know what what's what my vision here. is yeah exactly i'm i'm just gathering stuff and i know what i'm gonna do so just leave me alone or do what i tell you to do 
and like, don't worry about whether or not it makes sense to you. And so we see him, he's filming them from afar a lot of the times, yes. or he's, he's, yeah, just sort of like secretly or furtively filming them and then kind of like locking up and running away. Right. And- they have this big argument. Jeff and Britta are in the quad and they have this big argument about, you know, I guess Abed not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And Jeff's like, you were the one that wanted to get involved. And she's, you know, whatever. They have this whole thing where they're arguing about him like they're his parents. And they turn and look to the side and they see him like in the quad, bending yeah. down low, like backing away yeah, slowly. Like 50 feet away from it. Doing like trying to do a steady cam, even though he doesn't have a steady cam apparatus, trying to like back away. And so they're like, what? What is he doing? I don't know. He's your son is like the yeah. conversation. Now, how we should the conversation mention ends. Abed, his whole thing with this character is he's sort of on the autism spectrum, right. you know, right. and it's never really called out specifically. This is probably one of the first times that we, you know, really sort of deal with it. Like, I, I guess what you're supposed to understand about him, or at least how I always took it was, and again, something I relate to strongly, he understands the world through movies and he right. can communicate best like that. And a lot of times the movie uses him as a fun device for meta humor because he'll talk about his life and relationships as though it were a movie or a TV show. Right. So he'll be like, here we are at the season premiere of our fourth season season ha 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 but it really is or like oh i guess that character was written off the show or whatever yeah. and like that's part of the whole joke with him is he sees the world as a movie or a tv show and yes. so there's gonna and be so it'll, it is the way into a bunch of the meta stuff that happens yeah. like it's the reason that even though in this episode you get Joel McHale's character jeff calls out like oh this guy is a you know he's a doing a dead poet society thing right like he calls it out but more often than not it is danny putty who's doing the calling out like the abed character is being like oh that's this oh no this is this oh i see i get it i want to do you know this thing yeah and there'll be other episodes in the future that focus more on like how you know relationship wise how his sort of lack of you know emotional awareness and stuff like they'll really flesh him out yeah uh in ways that again don't don't make explicit any sort of like diagnosis but sort of hint at like yes this is something you know again 2009 right this is something that is very much in the public conversation sure. you know this rise in spectrum mm-hmm. uh, disorders and stuff and so yeah this one is just sort of laying that basic groundwork of here's a guy who sort of he thinks in movies like they used to say you know like he's just like that's how his brain works and what we're ultimately going to get you know, this this dad character, by the way, this very recognizable character actor, he's got some very uh, hip modern references, you know, oh, yeah. his way of putting down Joel McHale's character. He tells him, you go host American Idol right. and, and mind your own business. Which you they know? do over and over again with uh, with Joel McHale, which I just love because, you know, Joel McHale is... He's from the E! Network. He was doing that like yeah, new talk version ta- of Talk Soup that wasn't called Talk Soup anymore when he did it. And um, and so he always made fun of Ryan Seacrest. That was like, and still to this day is like one of his go-to things where he like makes fun of Ryan Seacrest. So it cracks me up that like they call him Ryan Seacrest and that's like a joke that's often written in yeah. to these community well, episodes. it fits though. He totally Oh, it does. He's, I mean, he's way like taller than Seacrest, but yes. Yeah, but still, the hair, I <laughs> yes. mean, they, they've got that same thing going on. Yes. He's he's a pretty boy. Also, just want to flag the similarity. He and Dennis in It's Always Sunny have the same 2009 thing of always clicking on the little phone. Yes. Like, it's just part of their shtick that they always have the phone out, both hands doing the little texting, typing Well, thing. but that's not an all-the-time thing for Dennis in Always Sunny. That was just a, that was just a okay, bit that enough. they did for I that show. I noticed it because yeah. they, Joel's always yeah. doing that. This sort of, this is all going to come to a head because Abed is going to trick everybody to show up in the same place by by telling them there's, con- there's a concert, right? He's going to tell Britta that there's a Ravi 
Did you catch who he yeah, said? Yeah, I, I, but it wasn't Robbie somebody. Something. It yeah, was not right. an artist that I knew. I wasn't yeah. familiar with either. It was but very then it pays like hip, off. cool, yes. um, indie artist that Britta would be into. Right, but it pays off when his dad shows up and goes, "Where's Weezer?" Right. You know? <laughs> but he's going to have them. He's like editing his movie right up until that. And they're all point. arguing. So yeah. like Britta and Jeff are arguing because that's what they do. And then the dad comes in and they realize that like Abed has set this up, and so they're, they're like Abed, da da da. And he's like, he's like, sit down, he, yeah. you know, and tells him where to sit. He's like, my movie's done. The movie that he shows them is all of these scenes that we've seen throughout the episode, mostly of Jeff and Britta talking to each other about Abed, right. just saying like just basic, straightforward things like he's weird. He's different. Don't you get it? Like you can't. What do you expect from a guy like that? You know? And then, yeah, like you said, Britta going like, I can't take this. Or why are you doing this? You know, you're not stupid. Why don't you think, you know, stuff like that. And yeah, basically... Abed has done a sort of like what you might see on the Conan O'Brien show right, in the late 90s right. or something. He's just <laughs> put his parents' heads uh-huh. on Jeff and Britta's like bodies. A, like a picture of them in the movie and then makes their mouths sort of like disappear yeah. so that when their mouths move, it's like this weird ghostly thing happening behind the picture that like mask that he's put on their face in a CGI way. Yeah. So again, a very sort of like 21st century like collage YouTube kind of thing and uh yeah it like very sort of plainly tells the story of his parents not knowing what to do with him right his, and his parents mom splitting up leaving. by the time he was six years old it's called the movie's called six candles yes. and it like the title is written in papyrus font <laughs> which is Jerry's favorite font. And so it goes up until like, basically it's like from baby until his like, and uh, until age four and then age four to age six is when like the parents fall apart and the fighting is all happening. And that's what he's showing. Yeah. Yeah. You have like Britta saying, you know, uh, like whatever, you know, I can't take this anymore and walking out of the frame and like everything just sort of perfectly lines up. But it doesn't really strain credulity because everything is so simple that it's like, yeah, it it all kind of works. And then he's also cut in his real dad that he just sort of secretly filmed. We didn't get to see this, but his dad just like staring forlorn into a mirror, you know, in the bathroom or something. His dad being sad and then also like reaching to the empty side of the bed and like, you know, kind of reach like where his wife used to sleep and just being sad in general that he's alone. Yeah. And that, you know, and so then they have this like father son moment where the dad is like he's speaking in arabic and he's like i never blamed you oh yeah well it cuts to when you they show you this whole movie pretty yeah. much unbroken and it's just like a little five minute thing and then it shows you jeff and britta just being like what the hell was that and then the dad is just like in tears like completely emotionally a mess and is just like like i have fully received the message that this movie was yes. you know was trying to say yeah and they're like Abed why you know they're starting to get like mad like Abed why did you do that like what are you and then they see that the dad is really upset and then they have the the father son moment where he's like you know I never blamed you for your mom leaving and um, Abed's like well you didn't have to and he's like if movies are the way that you understand the world then I will support you in that and I will pay for your film classes and you know, falafel will be your backup, though. And, and Aved's like, yes, falafel will be my backup. Okay. And it's really touching. Like, that's oh, yeah. the thing about community that it always does. It's not always really touching, but it's always really something. Oh, it's, it, it achieves what it goes exactly. for. Exactly. It is so well done. It is funny. It makes you laugh. And this one, it'll make you cry. Like, it's just really good. And we're on episode three. Like, there's no growing pains, no pun intended here. Like, they just get it. You know, they just know what they're doing. Like you said, they achieve everything that they're going for. And it really is a beautiful show. Yeah. Yeah. This scene is really effective, you know, having them speak in their language and everything like it just totally. Yeah, it pulls off that sort of tonal shift. And it's, you know, you buy into all the sentiment and everything. And yeah, in a lot of ways, this doesn't 
play by a lot of the tropes you know he's not making a horror movie it's not that same it the whole process of it doesn't feel like the other movies where it's like oh i'm gonna rope my friends into making this silly movie but what it does sort of get at is the the you know the idea of movies as like an art and a way of expression yeah i think that it um the way it's the same as the others is that the filmmaker does reveal something of themselves through the process of making the movie and that there is a little piece of some desire or something that they, um, you know, aspire to within the, the art project and, or the, you know, the film itself. And so I think in Doogie Howser, it wasn't the Vinnie Del Pino wasn't, we weren't, it wasn't revealing him, but it was more of, um, I think, Doogie realized a thing about himself by being involved in the in the project, right? Yeah. And again, it didn't it didn't take it as seriously, but you get a little bit of Vinny coming to realize that his movies are going to be his, you right. know, that's his true. unique signature voice for better <laughs> or worse. Yeah, that's true. All right, moving on to It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Season 5, episode 11, Mac and Charlie write a movie. Yeah, so at this point, like we said, we're well into the 2000s now. I feel like there are so many great fake movies and shows at this point. You know, like we we talked about The Office recently, so we're not covering it, but Threat Level Midnight, oh, the yeah. Michael Scott thing from The Office. <laughs> yeah. I think of like Milf Island and all of those great 30 <laughs> Rock uh, oh fake God, TV shows that. and movies. The Rural Juror. Rural Juror. Yeah, just uh, the Janis Joplin biopic that got turned into the Jamie Jorp Jomp biopic <laughs> because they couldn't get the rights. Like... I feel like shows at this time were really good at just kind of like having fun with these sorts of things. You're making a movie or something or writing a script within the show. And uh, yeah, this is going to be definitely not the first time or rather not the last time that uh, it's always sunny does this. Yeah. So this one is going to be about D having been cast in an M night Shyamalan movie. Right. right. M night is of course, famously from Philadelphia. He sets a lot of his movies there. So it makes sense that sooner or later they would make an episode about this. So already we're getting a shake up to the trope, right? Because yeah. this, this is about adults, first of all. And the and, movie is a real movie, not a homemade movie. Right. This, Well, yes and no, because right. we've sort of got two At things first. going. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a movie inspired by another movie. But right. yes, this is going to have almost the vibe of the Radioactive Man thing from The Simpsons, where Hollywood sort of descends on a town, yes. as it were, you know, because M. Night is going to be filming his movie. Uh, we later find out it's some sort of like a... It's like a epic. It's like a war about the Bosnian. Yes, like, yes. Yeah, so, know, like something. the the Bosnian Chechen, like Serbian Serbian. I don't know conflict. Yeah, and uh, yes. So if this is two thousand nine, the Sixth Sense came out in nineteen ninety nine. Okay. So M Night Shyamalan is probably like red hot at this point. I would have to think he's probably like on his fourth movie. Just trying to place that in time, you know, because M. Night Shyamalan has a different connotation nowadays. Right. Now it's um, a little bit of a, like a joke of yeah, itself. I mean, like, he's oh, been it's always a twist. Yeah. At this point, I feel like now people kind of like him again, but he's, yeah, he's had peaks and valleys. But I feel like at this time, he would really be considered like a major A-list movie director. Which is why D is so like, um, like I'm in an M. Night Shyamalan movie. I'm a featured actress, which we come to to find out she's a featured extra, yes. not a featured actress. Right. So she's going to go to their like holding tent or whatever. Well, I guess first she's going to report to the trailer. But meant she's for, like, trying the movie to like star. get into a, a trailer just randomly. And then this guy comes along and he's like, oh, you're OK. You're a featured extra, not a featured actress. No, I'm not getting you coffee. Go hang out in that tent over there until yes. we call you. This PA or assistant director or whatever is basically he's going to be recurring throughout the episode as her nemesis. He's the right. one in charge of wrangling the extras, basically. But uh, also is just like kind of, next to the guy who's like shooting the movie as well. So yeah, he's, he's kind basically of their one guy that's yeah. supposed to represent 
represent like yeah the person who's in charge on <laughs> this the set. like C team that's shooting this part of the movie because we find out later Shyamalan isn't even there. Yes, this is a second unit yeah. uh, shoot, which you know again just to share my you know Hollywood insider knowledge, meaning <laughs> like director not present. You know none of the major stars are there. This is some extra thing, some little flashback sequence or something, and so yeah, this I mean this is Dee's character in a nutshell, right? She's her whole story is going to be just fundamentally misunderstanding like what her role in all this is. And yes, her she's importance. A big deal and yes, she's not. everything. And yeah, ultimately like subjecting herself to this humiliation because she's just not willing to sort of let go of this goal that she has. Right. They uh, eventually douse her fully in blood. She looks like Sissy Spacek at the end of Carrie yeah. and she's supposed to lay face down. Right. She would love it if her role had any thing to do anything like, like Sissy Spacek and Carrie. Her role right. is to just be a dead body. Right. Uh, which she finds out from this PA when she asks him what her role is. Yeah, but so... That's going to be her thing, but just the fact that this movie is existing at all right. is going to inspire Mac and Charlie to write their own movie, right? Yeah. So we get this great scene of the two of them just sort of brainstorming. Oh, man. This scene and then the later scene when they pitch Dennis are like the tent poles in this episode. Yeah. They're just so good. So... If you're not, if you don't know Always Sunny, the thing to know about it is that the three guys that are in it, the three main guys, Charlie Day, um, Rob McElhaney, and Glenn Howerton, they are also the three main writers usually. Like yeah, Rob McElhaney is the, the creator, show. and then the other two kind of like joined in, and they they you know they all write this show together. And so this episode in particular was a Rob McElhaney and Glenn Howerton kind of story and they thought it would be really funny if they had Rob's character and Charlie who plays Charlie trying to write together and so because they do have this pattern of already existing themselves as real people in a writer's room they kind of were able to lift that I think and put it on the oh, screen yeah. in this funny way and so Charlie's character is always kind of like out there in left field he's a little bit crazy yeah well what's so funny is like Mac is an idiot like he's supposed to be like a total meathead but by comparison like right. he's like freaking albert einstein <laughs> next trying to charlie to, to deal with charlie yeah. yeah so they're sitting there and they're doing like a pitch thing with each other they're just like throwing out ideas and they're like all right you know what would be great it would be great if we like revive some old actor's career again like who's the greatest actor ever dolph lundgren yeah. yes and why is he the greatest actor ever because he has spiky hair Yes. And so and big muscles. And they're like, all right, great. So that's like how it starts. And then they're spitballing and they come up with this idea that he's this scientist, which fun fact, Dolph Lundgren actually is a chemist. I didn't know that. But well, that's I didn't like... know that either. <laughs> but they explain, Mac is like, we can't uh, cover up his body. Right. And so Charlie's like, oh this no, is don't worry. those nuggets of things that they always lay throughout the seasons that Mac is gay. Because yeah. he's always talking about how good looking men are, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, eventually he comes out and is gay. But right. I guess we're not there yet. No. But uh, yeah, Charlie is like, oh no, of course he's going to be wearing a mesh tank top. You know? Obviously, but, he's Dolph longer and we have to show off his muscles the funny thing about this and i don't know if it was their intention or not but to me charlie comes across as what it would be like to deal with studio notes and studio executives because <laughs> everything he says i know this even from my work it's like it just literally makes no sense and so like every time they start gaining momentum with their idea charlie would be like oh what if what if he has no eyes or yes. something and the big wait wait, wait no, what no, if his no. whole head is a nose yeah like he'll just be saying things what if that he's just... a dog an actual dog and he runs around on all fours yeah so and Dolph just, can do the voice. He just like goes a step or eight too far every yeah, time. It'll just stop it in its tracks by just being like just fundamentally senseless. But yeah, they eventually settle on, you know, they're talking about a chemist. He's talking about uh, rolling around on all fours. Oh, maybe that's because he was in an experiment with a dog. And then Charlie's like, what if he can smell 
crime. And they both are just like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Now we Because got that's something. the thing. Like, Charlie goes so far in one direction and he's all the way off on, like, he's running around all fours and he's actually played by a dog. Dolph Lundgren does the voice. Okay. And then he just keeps on going. He's like, and he has, but what if he has, like, superpowers like a dog? Like, he can smell really good. Like, he can smell, he can smell crime. And then they're like, yeah. And so it's like, he's so crazy. But then in the crazy, it, like, comes back around to normal and, like, has good ideas. Well, so I think that's highly debatable. That's what I was saying before. The fact that he can smell crime is a great movie it, idea. Yeah, it's an idea that Mac likes and so like they sort of meet in the middle there i think <laughs> it's debatable whether or not a it's idea. a good idea well so they decide that it's a good idea and then they're like all right now we're ready we're ready to go pitch to m night so uh in the meanwhile you've got frank who is danny devito and he has trying to get in on all this and he says he's going to be dennis glenn howerton's manager he's yeah. going to be his agent or whatever and he wants to be d's agent too and D's like no leave me alone I don't need anything from you but Dennis is just like his whole bit in this episode is that he doesn't like he's just into his phone he's just yeah, playing he's on, his phone. on his phone he's not listening to anything he's not paying attention to anyone he's just like yeah what okay you want to be my agent okay great oh I'm in a movie okay great yeah whatever yeah. like the whole his whole thing is just like I don't right. care and well, so because of that he just keeps failing forward in the movie business like he becomes he's like in the movie with no bad makeup and is gets to be face up and is like amazing within a second because he doesn't care yeah well and that also just plays into his relationship with d that she always ends up getting kind of like smushed in the dirt yeah he's like the psychopath that just glides glides through. through but since we're talking about dennis always on his phone we do need to drop the foreshadowing that the very beginning of the episode was charlie and mac telling Dennis this anecdote right. where they're like, oh, this crazy thing happened to us and we were stuck in the garage and then a crazy homeless guy attacked us, but then it turned out that he wasn't attacking us. He was just a, a janitor who wanted to he help us. He was a us. security guard yeah. who was going to let us out. Yeah. And so Dennis sort of dresses them down and is like, oh, so your story isn't a story. You're saying you were stuck in a garage for 15 minutes and somebody let you out. And then that kind of goes away, but that's Chekhov's garage anecdote. Right. And so we need to just keep that in the back of our minds. And so, yeah, the the rest of the story is going to be, yeah, Charlie and Mac pitching Dennis on like, okay, listen to our idea about the Dolph Lundgren crime sniffing nose man. Yeah. Well, so what happens is Frank is being Dennis's agent and the guys are like, the guys show up to pitch M. Night Shyamalan, but they can't find him. And Dee's like, yeah, I don't think he's here yet or I haven't seen him or whatever. And Frank's like, well, Dennis will be a producer. Yeah. Because that's all you have to do to be a producer is just say, I'm a producer. And so he's like, yeah, Dennis, do you want to be a producer? And Dennis is like, sure. And just continues like playing with his phone. And so then he goes, they like, they get a trailer, somehow are able to get into a trailer. D was never able to get into a trailer. They get into a trailer and they've got all of this yellow legal, legal paper, pads, yeah. paper just like everywhere. And every time they're trying to like tell them the idea, they're shuffling 87 yellow pages yeah. all around. And it's just, it's so funny. And so then they're pitching it to him and they're like, he smells crime and da, da, da. And then finally, Dennis like snaps to attention and he's like, yes. And the one thing that's always missing from action movies, women. We need a young, sexy lady that he can. And here's the hook. We're going to have full penetration in this movie. And then he says the word penetration about 47 more he times. Says, yeah. He says this needs a sexual punch up is yes. like his initial thing. <laughs> But, yeah, and then he proceeds to describe, like, his idea is to make it a porno. He's, right. He's, he's going to alternate between scenes, graphic action, sex scenes. And, and penetration. Then, action, penetration. Yeah. And then it just eventually ends. And that's the joke <laughs> there. But uh, the the comedy of Mac and Charlie pitching together, it's so funny the way the two of them will, like... It's almost like seeing like a pair of figure skaters like 
go apart for a little while and then come back together. It's like one of them will take charge and the other one will sort of like not approve of what of what right. he's saying <laughs> and start to he's sort like, of be his like, whole no, heads no, and nose. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's no, not it's like not that. that. It's not like that. But then he'll sort of come around and be like, yeah, yeah, no, listen to him, listen to him. It, though, that's what he's saying. And then they'll kind of like rest control of the conversation from each other and they'll go back and forth between, yeah, like agreeing with each other and then being kind of embarrassed by each other and yeah it was like neither one of them you know there is no like high and low status with right. charlie and mac and so yeah just the whole thing of them explaining this nose idea again and again is great and then yeah you know dennis adds the porn angle this eventually they they wind up charlie and mac wind up in the library and they find an indian kid or it turns right. out to be pakistani yeah well because uh, they say that they need to hire well they they try to write and they yeah. realize that like neither one of them is a fast enough typer to like get the ideas out in a quick fashion. So they're like, oh, we need to find a typist. And so they look over and there's an older lady. And then Charlie's like, old ladies creep me out. They're so judgy. And so then they there's a there's a guy in front of them that they're like, oh, he looks like he might be Indian. That's our way in because M. Night Shyamalan's Indian. Yeah. Well, Charlie so, goes, the Indians are great storytellers. That's right. They're good at twists. Yes, right. So then they start talking to this kid. And like you said, it turns out he's Pakistani. And they're like, and, and he explains to them that that's right next to india so they're like oh, oh yeah. that's perfect perfect even not knowing the like cultural you yeah. know significance between the two countries that really don't like each other and so he's like okay perfect that's great and so then they're they're like sitting there talking with this guy and he has all these kind of good ideas and they're they end up like bouncing ideas off of him as they're pitching it to him and then he's like adding things and making it more interesting and and better and and they're like great write that down and then he's like yeah i'm more of a big picture guy i'm not i'm not a writer you're gonna have to find somebody else to do that and they're like crestfallen because they thought they found their guy yeah and uh, meanwhile, back at the Shyamalan shoot, we have like, you know, D Dee's made her way through hair and makeup and stuff. And now, like you said, she looks like Carrie. She's just covered in blood and uh, they're trying to shoot the scene. And so this one we get sort of the subtrope of like the camera vision, but instead of it being like the camcorder blinking red thing, in this one we get like it it's like the movie itself. Right. Like with the movie. Yeah, score this is the only everything. episode where we don't actually get to see the movie. Right. That's we, we don't just see, see like the same assembled shot. Movie. Yeah. Right. We over see and them, over again. Yeah. But what they do for our benefit is they show it to us as though it's been edited. Yes. And... We have the music and there's all the. Yeah. It, exactly. it doesn't look like it, it looks like it's been produced. Right. So at first it seems like you're like they're showing us the actual movie and we're dropping us. They're dropping us into like, here's the epic sweeping shot of the camera, you know, panning past all this smoke and we're seeing all these bodies. Is it some kind of war movie? Right. And, and then, then Dee's like, Dee's like up on her hip, like trying to smile at the camera, posing yeah. like she's in a swimsuit, um, you know, whatever. And then Dennis is, Dennis is like laying there behind her and his phone's ringing. And so he gets on his phone and there's just all this. And the, that AD guy is like yelling at them. And so they both, you know, they're getting into these arguments. Eventually, they both get fired. And Frank's like, great, I wanted you to get fired because I don't want to be an agent anymore. I want to be in the movie. And then earlier on, he had been um, snacking on sausages that were in his front pocket, like his breast pocket. Yeah. So he was like, I don't have to use my hands and get them greasy at all because the sausages are in my pocket. So we get that same sweeping scene again. And then Frank is there like asleep or dead. And he's like, lay, you know, trying to get a bite of the sausage while he is laying there dead. Yeah, he's eating them out of his breast yes. pocket directly. Uh, yeah. And then the sort of end of this is Dennis revealing that he's been writing this script on his phone the whole time. Right. It's that he can't access now because the greasy fingers, Frank touched his phone with greasy fingers. And so it froze. Yeah. But so there's like, that's how it ends, right? Like there's yeah. no resolution or anything. No, 
it's a, always sunny. Any of there, this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there isn't even like a final like sort of like disaster. Or no, anything. It's, it's it is literally just Dennis doing his like ha ha ha. You thought that I was just playing on my phone, but all of this time, like his like evil genius, like never really genius though, but like his evil thing that he does, and he's like so there. Ah, oh, damn you, Frank! You messed up my phone. And yeah, that's and I guess just also the final reveal that this is like we said. A second unit shoot and M. Night Shyamalan isn't even here and so this whole right. thing has been for nothing I think that's also sort of meant to be like the final yeah. sort of capper on the whole thing so yeah in a lot of ways this one was kind of different in terms of filmmakers I would say Mac and Charlie are kind of like Roger Corman, like we talked about before, because they're like jumping on trends. You know, right. Corman made Piranha. He wasn't a director. He was a producer. But he made the Piranha movies because Jaws was a hit. Right. He made Carnosaur in the 90s after <laughs> Jurassic Park was a big thing. Slumber Party Massacre, you know, to cash in on the the slasher movies in the 80s. And so, and of course, like they're all kind of bad, right. you know, so that's what I'll put for Mac and Charlie as their sort of like real filmmaker uh, analog. But yeah, you know, I guess this doesn't, like I said, this doesn't really follow the tropes, what it gives us. Right, because we don't actually get to see their movie. I think they're more like these, um, you know, these like Hollywood types that are just like you're saying with the bad movie ideas that are, but it's like all about action and sex. Like that's, I think, yeah. more of like what they're if kind anything, of going for. Yeah, this was almost like what that show Entourage was showing us. Right. Like this yes. is all about the wheeling and dealing beforehand, you know, yeah. the pre production you know let's let's the coming up with the concept and who's gonna write it and who can we get to be in it and right. all that stuff uh yeah and then you get a little bit of the actual movie making with the Shyamalan set so what do we think making a homemade movie in a sitcom uh highlights low lights lessons learned what are we what are we well talking? so the lesson learned is that um films will reveal very much about their makers and their actors i think mm -hmm. that's the lesson learned and highlight a hundred percent was community i i mean i will always love community like i couldn't have said it better than you did everything they go for they just nail and it's so true it is it it literally is an episode of television that will make you laugh and cry and feel all the things. It's really lovely. The surprise for me was um, Doogie Howser. I didn't have the nostalgia for the episode like you did. And I always did like Doogie Howser, But this one choked me up. I thought it was a good episode of television. So I enjoyed the those two. Yeah. Uh, like I said before, Growing Pains is not... A favorite of mine, and I think, yeah, this Ben... I want to keep trying, though. Sure, but I would say in the future, uh, no more Ben... No more Ben-centric centric episodes. episodes. Because, <laughs> yeah, he's a little creep. And an episode all about how <laughs> he's making a movie just to put this girl who's already agreed to be his girlfriend to make, him ki make her kiss him on camera and give us, the audience, lots of weird little looks and smiles and winks and stuff. They're trying to tee him up to be the next Kirk Cameron as the older yeah, and the uh, first generation Kirk of Cameron kids are moving on. Is not not somebody that I'm a fan of then hey, or now. Yeah, but that's at all. not that's you weren't the target audience, Jay. It's always sunny is great. That's always a riot. It is but, so funny. It was a very funny episode. But in terms of like yeah. getting to see the actual movie, trope wise, yes, yeah. it didn't fit in as much. And so yeah, Doogie is a classic to me for all the reasons that I said. Uh, it's just fun to see that sort of like, oh yeah, this is what it might look like if a teenager made a monster movie in the nineties. And you know, the very sort of sitcommy uh, storyline about the other prodigy learning to loosen up a little bit was definitely like that was well done for what it was so yeah that's great and then i feel like community is a great sort of counterpoint to that yeah what makes community so great to me in addition to all the other things we said was because it is 2009 
you're starting to see how like making a movie, quote unquote, it's starting to shed some of those 20th century tropes. So, you know, you don't have that same sort of like quiet on the set, lights, camera, action. Oh, let's look through my black and white viewfinder. Let's have it be an old monster movie that calls back to movies from 1968. You know, like now you have, oh, a movie could be something you make on your phone or on the, you know, camcorder or the computer or whatever and you see that more sort of like on the go editing and everything that he's able to edit it you know while sitting there with them and then show it to them and so unlike Ben who was really talented at 14 years old and editing in camera yeah and so, uh, yeah, the way it's able to say so much about his character and his relationship, yeah. but also it's sort of, you know, it just kind of gives you a glimpse into like the way things were changing in terms of filmmaking and stuff. No, uh, I, that's true. Yeah. All really, really good. All right. So much for the homemade movies. What are we talking about next week? Well, you're going to need to cross your fingers, spin around three times and spit over your left shoulder because some bad luck is coming your way. I saw you throw that chain letter out. Next week, we're talking about chain letters, Jay. We are watching All in the Family, Season 6, Episode 6, Chain Letter. The Facts of Life, Season 5, Episode 13, The Chain Letter. Home Improvement, Season 1, Episode 19, Unchained, Malady, and Third Rock from the Sun, Season 4, Episode 16, Superstitious Dick. Yep, that's next week, and until then, we will consider this segment of the sitcom study concluded. Thank you for listening to The Sitcom Study. Tell us what you think or share your own TV tropes and topic ideas by sending a self-addressed stamped email to sitcomstudypodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram. And if you like the show, consider leaving a rating or review on your podcast app. It helps us boost those precious Nielsen ratings. The Sitcom Study is recorded in front of a live studio dog. 